Just real quick, um, we are gearing up for that Resurrection Sunday play. If you want to be a part of it, whether it's in the background or holding up a live or helping us out with sound or songs or whatever, please come in. I think it's going to be very special. There are some things that God has been showing us, and we've been trusting him, and he's been showing up every single time. Um, if you are visiting for the first time, we'd just like to acknowledge you. Would you raise your hand if you're visiting for the first time? We're not here to embarrass you. What's your name, ma'am? Sarah, thank you so much for being here with us. God bless you. I thank you very much for having us. And you feel all of us, but more than that, that you feel his love. And if nobody said hello to you, you tell me right now, we're going to line everybody up and we're going to make her say hello to you. You good? Okay. Amen. All right. Sister, what is your name? Blanca. Blanca. Let me tell you something about Blanca. Blanca helps us out with the clothing ministry. She goes and sorts things out. She never wants recognition, and she's visiting with us here this morning. What I'm saying is, she's not even a regular member, but yet she serves every time that she comes over here. On Thursdays as well, we have people that don't even attend this church, and they're serving, and, and they watch online. And so, Lupe and Smiley, God bless you. Thank you, for, thank you for watching. And everyone else, Sister Elena, Sister Rose, everyone that helps us out, Brother Thomas, Brother Fred, who am I missing? I said it, and I didn't know Brother Robert. Brother Robert? Oh, that's right. Brother Robert Fernandez. Uh, and and they, they do it for the honor and glory of God. And so many people pitch in. Brother Johnny, he pitches in. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. If you ever want to come and help on a Thursday afternoon, you want to adopt a, a, a heart of servitude, please come and join us. It's a beautiful thing to put people's, uh, put smile on, smiles on people's faces and also just to bless them in the Lord. Um, so a little, a little pitch there for, for our food pantry ministry. We also have a service on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. It's one hour. I tell you it's one hour, but everybody hangs out afterwards. Um, and it, we've been really growing, and, we've been, and God has really been moving. So please come be a part of it. Um, if, is there anybody else who's visiting? All right. So I found out today, a little birdie told me that today is Sister Rose's birthday. So, Sister Rose, would you come up here? Is there anybody else who has a birthday in February? We'd like to wish you a happy birthday. Louis. Anybody else? Mom. My beautiful mom. Come on up here, brother. Come on up here. Erica, brother Robert. Oh. <laughs> 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 they sit too long. <laughs> We're going to give you a double blessing. Yeah. 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 For those of you who don't know, this is my beautiful mother. This is where I get my goodness from. And my attitude is kind. This is where Adrian gets her attitude from. Brother Robert, amen. Um, Brother Jesus Merle, he got married in February. Is that correct? Where's he at? He's still back there praising the Lord. All right. Would everyone please extend your right hand? We're going to pray a blessing over these beautiful people that are up here. Heavenly Father, we pray for you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And we ask that you would bless each and every one of them. And no matter how big this church gets, Lord, that everyone in here would always feel special. This is a day that we celebrate the fact that you've given our brothers and sisters life, another year of life. And I pray this, Lord, that this year, that they would get closer to you. And that they would that you would grab them by the hand and that you would usher them into the destiny that you have for them. I pray that in Jesus' name. And Lord, you get the glory. And I thank you for allowing us the opportunity, the privilege, and the honor to be able to know these wonderful people. In Jesus' name. Amen. One. Two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Duncan. Happy birthday to you. Thank you all so much. You can go to your seats. I know you want to stay up here for the remainder of the service.
I'm going to do something that I never do. Um, Brother Marcus and Sister Denise, they are, they are in charge of the youth, and they're doing an amazing job, and I thank God for them. What I love about them is this, is that every one of us needs to receive at some time. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Every one of us. Every one of us. And I say that because a lot of times people will be like, well, if someone told me preacher, I ain't going. Right? <laughs> and I feel like God has a word for you. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Amen? Amen. And it's never about the person who's up here preaching. It's always about Jesus and what he has for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So one Sunday a month, you're going to see Brother Marcus and Sister Denise back here receiving. And I say that for this reason is because we're going to start a rotation of people helping us out, not only here at this pulpit, but in the children's church ministry and the youth. Because we want everyone to receive and grow in the Lord. And because we're in this together. Amen. 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 So it's a form of accountability. So what I'd like to do is this. Sister Lisa, God has given her a word for today's youth. And we're going to pray that God would use her right now over there. And that God would use me in here. Is that okay? Amen. So I've asked my wife to stay up here with me. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pray a blessing over here. Brother Lou, would you come up here and pray for your wife? I'm not trying to be gross, but. Now, I want y'all to know she said I can't go with her. Uh, I was going to go with her. Uh, she said, no, I don't want to. She was making me nervous. I'm not nervous. I'm looking forward to it. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, Lord. And I pray this that you would anoint not only my sister Lisa, but that you would anoint whoever is doing the children's church today in the name of Jesus. That children would come to know you as their Lord and their Savior, and that you would use me in this service, Father God. And Lord, that chains would be broken. You once asked the prophet Isaiah, whom shall I send? And Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. And this morning we stand in the gap with that kind of attitude, and we say, Lord, here we are. Send us. We're willing and we're available. All we want to do is be your instrument, your voice piece, your tool against the enemy. And I pray that you would set captives free. That you would loosen and break and bind chains and devils and demons. And Lord, that you would be glorified, that you would be exalted, and that people would make commitments to follow you after you with all of the, with everything that they got. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So at this time, we're going to have the children's church go to the children's church, and the youth go to the youth. You all ready? Let's go to war. Amen? Yeah. Let's go to war. The shofar has been sounded, and it's time to go get that devil for everything you try to take away from us this week. The title of today's mes message is Flourishing in Famine. Flourishing in Famine. If you have your Bibles, normally we put them up there for you. This morning we've had some te technical difficulties, but it's all right. The devil ain't going to stop us. If you got your Bibles, if you would open them up to Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26, verse 1 through 6. I'm reading this out of the New Living Translation, or the NLT. Genesis chapter 26, verse 1. And it says this. Please pay attention, because it's going to get deep this morning. It says, a severe famine now struck the land, as it happened before Abraham's time. So Isaac moved to Gerar, where Abimelech, the king of the Philistines lived. The Lord said to Isaac, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in this land, and I will bless, I will be with you, and I will bless you. I hereby confirm that I will give all these lands to you and to your descendants, just as I solemnly promised to Abraham, your father. I will cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky, and I will give them all of these lands. And through you, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Believe it or not, God was talking about Jesus in that scripture right there. Because Jesus came through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then it says this, I will do this. 
For those of you who want to know why God would do this or why he picked Abraham and why he picked the Jews, it's because of verse 5. It says, I will do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerard. Isaac was obedient, probably because daddy was obedient to the Lord. And this morning, I want to share with you once again what God has been showing me and revealing to me in my personal reading time. I want to share something with you out of my war chest because if you've been paying attention for the last several years, you know, my wife was just talking about how we're going to have a servant leaders meeting. We haven't had that since before COVID. So we're going on three years since ever having a servant leaders meeting. Why? Because out of an abundance of safety. But it's time for us to start taking back everything that the enemy has tried to stand for. Right. And in the last several years, this world's gotten crazy. It was crazy already, but it's gotten even crazier, amen? Yeah. And yet in the middle of everything, there are believers worldwide everywhere. Every believer that comes away, they come to this church or they go to another church, what they are saying is that they can sense that something big is about to happen, that God is getting ready to do something big in this world. Can you sense it? Yes. Can you feel it? Every time that you turn on social media or every time that you turn on the news, all of a sudden you see it. And I believe this. I believe that God is preparing us for what's about to happen next. And we, we as the church, we have to be ready. We can't get caught up in all the hustle and bustle and confusion of life. We have to focus our attention on what God is doing now, today. Because if not, then we'll miss it. Man, I would have hated to miss this Sunday morning. Because I really believe that God has something for you. So this chapter starts off by letting you know that there was a severe famine in the land. Some of your versions may say a great famine. It wasn't just an ordinary fam famine. It was a severe famine is what it says. And then it lets you know that in the middle of this famine that God was telling Isaac that he was going to bless him. And that he was going to bless him as long as he was obedient like his daddy Abraham. And he was going to bless him in the midst of a famine, a severe famine. God promised to provide in the middle of a severe famine. Now, I want you to think about it for just a moment. When the whole world shut down, was not God still faithful and providing for each and every one of us while the rest of the world was running out of toilet paper and God knows what else? God was still providing for you and I. While everything was going crazy in the world, God was still faithful and he was still showing up and he was still showing his power, his glory, and his might. And he is worthy of all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise because as Amen? Amen. I find it interesting because God took care of his people. We lost a lot of people during that time, but God still took care of us. And what that lets you know, when God makes a promise like this in his word, it lets you know that you shouldn't have to worry about everything that's going on all around you because God will provide no matter what's going on. He takes care of his people. There's a scripture that says, though a thousand may fall at your left and ten thousand at your right hand. And it will not come near your dwelling place. place. you got to trust in the Lord. Instead of saying, oh, why did this happen to me? And golly, I don't understand. You, know, you, know, you might not be able to understand. God hasn't opened it up yet. He hasn't revealed it yet. But you got to stay the course. Because there are people who will say, well, I quit. I give up. You don't quit and give up when it comes to the Lord. God is doing something. And he's using even the hard times to grow you and to mature you and to take you to the next level. Amen? I couldn't wait for y'all to get here this morning. <laughs> How many of you know that the Holy Spirit is still working even when you don't see him working? Amen. Even when you don't feel him, he's still working. And I'm not just quoting a song. That's real. Amen? One thing you have to understand is that in order for you to walk in the blessings of God and the promises of God and in the purpose of God for your life, it's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. Many of us, we want things to happen and we want them to happen right now. And that's not the way it works. There's a process to it. We live in a day and age where people, they just want everything and they want it right now. They want it when they want it. But if you pay attention to scripture, since the beginning of time, God has been on the move. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 1, 
It says that the Spirit of the Lord hovered upon the waters, that, it, that the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the waters. And elsewhere in Scripture, the Bible records that the armies of God were moving on the top of the trees. The Holy Spirit is always moving, and you have to be able to move when God says to move, and you have to be able to be still when God says to be still. Not when you want to, and not when I want to, but when God tells us to do it. You have to be able to move and flow and move with a, with a move of God. You have to be able to do that. And sometimes God will use things like persecution. If you don't believe me, read your Bible. All of the New Testament, God allowed persecution to get his word out there. He'll use a pandemic. He'll use a pestilence. He'll use a famine. He'll use an opportunity. He'll use a blessing. And many times, you and I, what we will do is we'll pray against the bad things that are happening in our lives because we think that it's the devil who's doing it. And so we start rebuking devils and we start rebuking demons. But God will use war and he'll use an earthquake and he'll use food shortages. He'll use toilet paper shortages. He'll use plagues. He'll use meat shortages. He'll use opportunities. He'll use persecution. He will use everything. He'll use your car not starting. He'll use you getting into an argument before you came to church. And he will use it all to move you into the place that he wants you to be. And many times, God will not move in what we want him to move. And we start throwing a fit because we want God to submit to our will instead of the other way around. Amen. And sometimes God will allow us to go through an experience or a problem or a trial or a situation or a struggle to pressure us and to force us into the next level. Because otherwise we will not move. And that's why rebuking the enemy doesn't always work. And so sometimes you got to look at your problem, and you got to look at your trial, and you got to look at your tribulation, and you got to look at your struggle, and you got to look, look at your situation and your circumstances and say, is this thing, is it, is it taking me further away from God, or is it drawing me closer to God? If it's drawing you closer to God, then it's probably God allowing you to happen. Yeah. You see it? That's a good rule of thumb to live by. If it's pulling you away from God, then chances are it's probably from the enemy. Amen. God will use that problem or that situation or that circumstance to move you into the next thing that he has for you. But God doesn't just move in our situations, and he doesn't just move in our circumstances. He moves in eternity, and he moves to set us up for eternity. Sometimes God doesn't move you just for you. You hear what I'm saying? I know some of you are shocked, some of you are like, what? What? Sometimes he doesn't move you for you. Sometimes he moves you for the generations that are coming after you. Amen? Amen. And you might not even understand it when it's happening, but that's because God moves in eternity. He's making an eternal move in your life. And he's setting you up for not just for you, but for your children, for their children, for your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. And a lot of times people will get upset because they feel that God hasn't moved in their situation. They've been praying about things, and they're like, God, why haven't you moved in this situation? But God is more concerned about moving you for eternity than he is about your comfort and about what you want. He is more concerned about moving you for your generation so that he can use you for what he created you for. Not for what you want, but for what he created you for. And sometimes God will use a situation or a problem or a circumstance to move a generation into a position to set them up for eternity. If you don't believe me, just read your Bible. And you will see him use king and judge and ruler and bad guy and good guy to set up everything he's doing for such a time as this. God has a plan and he has a strategy that many of us in this room, we don't understand. And he has a way of moving that is above our way of thinking. The Bible says that his ways are above our ways. That his thinking is above our thinking. And yet God has a plan, and many times we don't want to be inconvenienced because we don't know what that plan is yet, because he hasn't revealed it to us. But God has a plan, and that sometimes that plan that he has for your life, it's going to inconvenience you, because it's part of the process. There are some things that he needs to root out of you. There are some things that we've been taught that might not be right, and the many of us, we refuse to change. In reality, we have to be willing and available to God to allow him to change us however he wants to change us. You know that God told Abraham, as I've been reading the book of Genesis, God told Abraham what he was going to do to Abraham's people for the next 400 years. He laid out the plan, and he even told them how they were going to get out of it. You see, God doesn't operate in mind in your time. He operates in the, in the realm of eternity. Time is irrelevant to God. We're the ones that have issues with time. 
You know the Bible says that God works all things after the counsel of his own will, which he has, some Bible say, predestined, others say which he has purposed in himself since the beginning of time. In other words, God is working to accomplish his will, not mine and your will. What you and I need to do as believers and as followers of Christ, we need to get in line with God's will. Instead of trying to make God submit to our will, we need to submit to his will. Because God is God. Not you, not me, and not anybody else for that matter. God is God. Amen? Amen. God's not your butler. He's not your genie so that he can be summoned at your beck and call. God is God, and he will move when he feels like moving. That's not how it works. God is God, and he's in control. See, some of you have been wondering if God is even able to deliver you from your circumstances. He's even going to be able to figure things out for you. Well, I came here this morning to tell you he's got it all figured out according to the scripture. The Bible says that God has determined the end from the beginning. Amen. And that should give you hope this morning. That means that God already has it all set up for you. The answer to the prayer that you have been given an answer to, God has already answered it. It's just a matter of you getting what you need to get so that way he can move. In other words, you shouldn't be worrying about anything in your life because God's going to show up and he's going to provide. And here in this text, God was telling Isaac that he had had a covenant. In other words, he already had a solution for the problem that they were having because of the promise that he had made to Isaac's dead father, Abraham. Picture that. Abraham was dead. God didn't have to keep his commitment. God had given Abraham his word. And if you don't know this, I want to tell you this morning, God always keeps his word. Amen. Always, always, always. Even, even if it's a dead man, God always keeps his word. That's the kind of integrity that you deal with when you come and when you deal with God. He always keeps his word. And if you want to know what he's got to say, all you got to do is open up his word and read it for yourself. Don't count on the preacher or the pastor or the reverend or the priest to save you. Open up his word. Open up God's word and read it for yourself. And you'll find out who God is and what he's all about. You see, some of us in this room, we can't even keep our word to the living. But God will keep his word even to the dead. There are very few people who will keep their word even after someone has died. And God was getting ready to bless Isaac because he had made a promise to his daddy, Abraham. And God had said it, and when I read it, that he was going to do it all in the middle of a severe famine. You see, God will keep his promise to you in spite of what's going on in your life. God will keep his promise to bless you even in the middle of a crisis and even in the middle of a problem, even in the, in the middle of a sickness. And oftentimes, your blessing will come through a crisis. Your blessing will come through a problem. Amen? Amen. This is experience talking here. I told you all a while back that my daughter had become, she's not here, right? All right, I, just, I didn't want to embarrass her. That's what she gets for not coming to church. Amen? Nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I told y'all a while back that my, one of my daughters, I'll say it like that, I'll keep it generic. One of my daughters had become real rebellious. And I said, Lord, whatever it takes, save her. Whatever it takes, save her. And then she got pregnant. But would you know that after she's gotten pregnant, she's praying now, she's seeking God. I said a prayer, God, whatever it takes, save her. She named her baby Isaiah Micah. But those are biblical names. And even just this week, in the middle of our busy week, in the middle of everything that was going on, she was sharing with me what she had been praying about. And I, man, it took everything inside of me to hold back tears because I realized that God is faithful. Amen. And the same little girl who was rebellious is now clinging to the Lord. Provide all her needs. Amen? So if I can say it like this, don't leave where God has placed you. And don't leave what he has placed you in because God will provide for you and he will protect you in that place, even if it's the storm of your life. Remember last week, for those of you who were here, I talked to you about how Hagar had run away from Sarah because the way Sarah was treating her and then God appeared to her the angel of the Lord appeared to her, and the Bible says that he told her, that God had told her to go back to her master Sarai because God was going to bless her. She had to go back to what she was running away from so that God could bless her. And I believe that God is telling somebody to 
in this room to stay put and to stay right where you're at because he's about to bless you in the middle of the storm that you're going through. He's about to bless you in the middle of the trial that you're going through. He's about to bless you in the middle of the circumstance that you're in. But you got to hang on and hold on to Jesus with everything that you got. You should only move when God says to move or when God is moving. That's the only time that you should move. When God moves, you move. You don't stay where you're at. You move with the tent and you move with the cloud and you move with the sun. Be ready for change. Have your, your, your suitcase back, but you wait upon the Lord. You don't just go take matters into your own hands and do it yourself. Amen? Amen. And God is about to bring change into somebody's life. And sometimes change will require for us to be uncomfortable. It'll cause discomfort. Change will require for you to stay humble and to trust God and not yourself. You know, the Bible says that God will exalt the humble. That's change. As long as you stay humble and stay obedient and stay available to God, he will bring change into your life. And the Bible says that God was blessing Isaac in that land. When I was doing some research, I found out in that land that God was talking about, that land didn't even belong to Isaac or his people. But yet, God was going to put it. As a matter of fact, Scripture reports that they were leasing the land from Abimelech. They were leasing it. It wasn't even theirs. But how many of you know that that doesn't stop God from blessing you? How many of you know that it doesn't even have to be yours? If God says it's yours, it's going to be yours no matter whose it is. It is yours. The Bible says that He takes what's from the wicked and He gives it to His people. That's the God that you and I serve. None of this stuff stops God. But God has to be with you. When God is with you, nothing can stop God. Amen? And according to Scripture, God will always provide. When you belong to God, He's got you covered. You don't have to worry about it. As a matter of fact, if I could help you change your prayer life just a little bit, whenever a problem presents itself, or whenever it shows up in your life, instead of saying, oh God, what are you going to do? Let me tell you something. Number one, it doesn't surprise God. Nothing surprises God. Number two, instead of coming to the throne with that type of attitude, how about you come to the throne saying, Lord, I can't wait to see how you're going to show up in this. Because I don't know how to do it. Amen. Right? Amen. The doc says you've got three months to live, you got cancer. You know what? It's just an opportunity for God to show off his power, his glory, and his mind in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's how we got to approach the throne. Instead of saying, oh God, why did you do this to me? Why did you let this happen to me? Instead of saying that, I've always said, God, I can't wait to see you show up here. I know what the doctor said. I know what the lawyer said. I know what my spouse has said. I know what my children have said. But what do you got to say about this, Lord? Because the Bible shows me that he's got the final say so, that he's the author and finisher of our faith. Amen? Amen. So it don't matter what anybody else says, God's got the final say so. Even when the fat lady sings, God still has the final say so. Amen? Amen? Can I say that again? Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. I had a check with the censor committee back there in the back. Only God can make something out of nothing. Think about it. How many of you look nothing like what you came from? Amen. Right? From the hood that you came from, you don't even look like it. Except for every once in a while, when you get mad, you said the sun is something, right? <laughs> Right? Amen? But when you get around the family, all of a sudden you start talking like, other people are like, I didn't know you were talking about that. <laughs> There's someone in here who beat all the odds. All the odds were stacked up against you, and God still gave you the victory. Some of you shouldn't even be where you are right now. Some of you shouldn't have made it according to statistics. Some of you should be dead right now, but yet God showed up in your life, and he stopped death, and he had another plan for your life, so that way you can honor and glorify him on this side of salvation. If some people saw where you came from, it would blow their minds. You see, it doesn't matter where you come from. It matters where you're going. It doesn't matter how you started. What matters is how you finished this thing. And some of you started out in the most horrible situations, and yet God was with you, and he protected you, and he saw you all the way through, and now he's blessing your life. That's the God that we serve. And that's why you should praise him. Some of you were blessed in spite of your situation, and in spite of your circumstance, and in spite of where you came from. So quit acting like you did it all by yourself. 
I'm self-made. Shut up. God protected you, and he provided for you all the way, and that's why you're here. God will always provide, but are you willing to do whatever it takes to get the blessing that he has for you? Are you willing to make those changes for it? Are you willing to pray for it? Are you willing to fight for you? Are you willing to make whatever changes God is calling you to make so that you can get the blessing that he has for you? You see, it's going to require an effort on your part. We can't just sit back and let God do all the work. There has to be an effort on our part. Amen? Amen. Amen. And this morning, you might not feel like, like you're blessed, but I want you to know that your blessing is coming. You might not even know where it's going to come from. You've looked everywhere, but God somehow is going to provide a way. He's about to bless you. Somebody in here, you're under covenant with God, and he has promised to bless you. And like I told you earlier, God always keeps his promises. If you think back on your life and you look at all the things that he brought you out of, and you look at how he saved you, that's my God. That's my God who showed up in your life. Some of you came from a dysfunctional family, but God raised, still raised your shoe. My family, we put the fun in dysfunction. <laughs> Amen? Amen. My son, am I right? My, my sister, my son. Right? Hey, we're dysfunctional, but we had fun doing it. And God blessed us anyway. And the truth is, is this, is that there are some times where there are some people who complain so much about what they don't have. And the truth is that you need to stop complaining about what you don't have. You need to start being thankful and praising Him for what you do have. Amen. Praise Him for all the blessings that you have that you know, you and I both know you didn't deserve. Praise him for his mercy and his grace. As a matter of fact, praise him and let hell hear you praise God. Let hell know that you say he can't stop you from praising God. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that when you acknowledge God in all of your ways, that he will direct your paths and that he will make you straight. He will order your steps and he will lead you and he will guide you and he will nudge you and he will beckon you and he will tug at your heart and he will direct you and he will tell you what to do. If you start acknowledging God in all that you do, I promise you that you will have a relationship with him. My God, I feel something in this place this morning. I feel like a yoke is being broken over God's people. I feel like revival is coming into this church right now in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Think about all that God has saved you from and now. God still wants to do a new thing in you. You see, change is coming into your life, but people don't like change. You have to be willing and available to accept that change. And it's not just for you, it's for everyone who's coming after you. If I could say like this, God can use you to change your world, and it's not too late. If you're still here and you have a breath in your lungs and you have a heartbeat, God will still use you. How do I know? Because the Bible says that he is the resurrection and the life. God can bring you back to life. He is the resurrection and the life. And I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but God sent me here to tell you to get ready because he's about to bring some people who are spiritually dead back to life because he is the resurrection and the life. He's getting ready to bring some dead marriages back to life. He's getting ready to bring some dead relationships back to life because he is the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And anyone who believes in me will live even after they die. That's a God that I serve. And sometimes God doesn't just bless you for you. He blesses you to be a blessing to others. And God may be using you to, he may be using problems to shift you into a place where he can bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. Isaac flourished in famine. You know the word Isaac means laughter? Laughter flourished in famine. Laughter. That tells me it's important, no matter what you're going through in your life, to have a laughter every once in a while. You gotta remember who Isaac is. Isaac was the one that the Bible says that God was gonna that Abraham was gonna sacrifice him to the Lord. Now, people forget this. Anybody know anybody in here know how old Abraham was when he had Isaac? Anybody? I hear 90, 95, 100. 100. Anybody know? You want to Google it? <laughs> Anybody know without a shadow of a doubt how old Abraham was? 101. Somebody, 101, Brother Robert? Okay, we'll go with that. Does that sound good to everybody? 101 going once, 101 going twice. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so check this out. I need you to picture this because when we read the story, Right? We 
read it and we think, because it says that Abraham took the lad. Y'all with me? And he took some wood, right? And the lad said, it was at Isaac. He said, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said what? The Lord will provide, right? That's where we get the name Yahovah. Jireh, thank you. The Lord provides. <laughs> I threw another Hebrew word in there just to impress back there. Right? So he's, he's 101, like Robert said. And it says that he took the lad. Well, the translation for lad doesn't mean little boy. It means young man. In other words, Isaac was old enough to resist his father's will. You with me? He was old enough to overpower his father's will. But because he loved his father, because he respected and revered his father, he submitted to the father's will. I'm going to show you something. David, would you come up here, please? This wasn't scripted. I thought about it when I walked in here this morning. And the reason why I called David and not anybody else is because David's like taller than everybody else in this room. So, <laughs> so I want you to picture this. No, no, I got it. I'm a rookie, bro. We're gonna run. Now, nah, yeah. <laughs> no. so look, you're gonna help me, though, okay? <laughs> so Isaac was old enough to overpower Abraham. You with me? He was old enough to overcome his father's will. So picture this. Abraham is tying up. Come here, bro. I need you to be my gun. Can you hold that? So tie me up. So Abraham is tying up Isaac. Okay, now start wrapping it around my body. And the whole time that he's tying it around, at any time he could have broken free. But instead what he's doing is he's saying, ah, dad, dad, you gotta get it tighter over here because I can still get loose. <laughs> Submitting to the will, right? Because he's a sacrifice and at some point he realizes that he's the sacrifice. You with me? Dad, I can break free, you need to tie it tighter. I know this is for somebody in this room this morning. And the Bible says that Abraham raised up the knife to sacrifice his one and only son. He had been barren. He was, he was unable to produce or reproduce. His wife's womb had been barren. As a matter of fact, they had taken matters into their own hands and they went to Hagar. Remember I talked about that last week? And Sarah said, hey, sleep with my servant. Maybe I can have children through her. And Abraham was like, okay, right? And so he did it. <laughs> you twisted my arm, baby. If that's what you want, I'm only doing it to please you, mama, right? Or whatever. <laughs> Instead of standing up and being a man and saying, no, we're going to trust in God. Right? We got to stand up. Our generation has to stand up and trust in God. This is what I'm telling you. Abraham raised his knife to sacrifice his one and only son that God had given him. You with me? And the Bible says, but God stopped it. I don't know who this is for. But you were involved in a car wreck. And you're sitting there wondering, why did this have to happen to me? Not realizing that death came for you that day. But God stopped it. Amen. Some of you, you were in a drive-by shooting. And you're wondering, how did I survive and how did I live? I came here to tell you, but God stopped it. Some of you, you've been, you've been, thank you, you've been stricken with a sickness and a disease, and you're wondering why cancer hasn't taken you. It's because my God has stopped it. Amen. You're wondering why attempted suicide didn't kill you. It's because God stopped it. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Instead of focusing on your problem, start focusing on what God has for your problem and be that living sacrifice. That's what God wants from you and I. He wants us to sacrifice. There are things that I love. That I've told you this week after week. There are things that I love to do to people because of the old person that I was. And I was like, dude, you would have never gotten away with this and you know it. Right? And I would tell God, Lord, you know they wouldn't have gotten away with this. It would have been on. Right? Other times I said, Lord, just look away. For five minutes, look away and then come back. Amen? Amen. Y'all with me or no? I'm, I'm, am I talking to real Christians or am I talking to them? Amen. If not, let me know and I'll change it up. I'll change it. I'll make it PG. Amen? 
Isaac was a type of Christ, was a foreshadowing of Jesus. You see, Jesus, I mean, yes, Jesus is our sacrificial lamb. Jesus is my year sacrifice. That's why you and I, if we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that's why we're not held by Because God sent his one and only son to be our sacrifice. That whole lesson that God gave Abraham and Isaac up there on that mountain was to let Abraham know, I'm bringing the sacrificial lamb. God will provide the lamb. That's what it was referring to. That's why Abraham said when he said he had a hint. And I believe this, that God did the same thing with you. Some of you in here, you had a heart attack, you had strokes, but God stopped you from dying. And that's why you're still here. You see, you're not, he's not done with you yet. Amen. And I'm telling you that God has a, something big in store for you, and he's about to bless you abundantly. So don't get caught up in, in all the word and all the rumors about COVID or the war in Ukraine or gas prices or earthquakes or UFOs or satanic rituals whenever you're watching the game or whatever it is. In the middle of all of that, God is still bringing revival into the house of God even now. God is still in control. And I'm telling you that God is up to something big. He's up to something big. And my question to you is, you got to think about it. It's all right, just answer it and tell them to come to church. We're not done yet. Amen. <laughs> nah, but you know what? Put them on speaker because we're going to preach to them right now. <laughs> just kidding. Can I get the praise and worship team up here? I don't know who this is for, but I know it's for somebody. I hope you don't mind when you come to me. God is doing something. You hear about that uh, revival that's taking place in that college in Kentucky? Let me tell you what they did. There are four, there are four requisites for any church to have revival. A group of college students were seeking God's face, and they went before the altar. They repented of their sins. Hear what I'm saying to you. They repented of their sins and they dedicated and or rededicated their lives to Christ. And they said, God, whatever you want, I want it. Lord, not my will, but thy will. Not my agenda, but your agenda. Not my schedule, your schedule. Not my plan, your plan. God, I'll trust you. And they went and they repented they asked for forgiveness of their sins, and they went after God with everything. They put aside whatever they were struggling with, whatever they were dealing with, whatever secret sin they had, and they laid it all down at the altar, and God took them serious. Not just in Kentucky. It happened in Azusa. It happened in Pensacola, Florida. You see, we can go and define all throughout history, and I'm telling you that if you start studying these revivals, I'm talking about real revivals. I'm not talking about... Hey, Journey to the Cross Church is having a revival next weekend. Not one of those kind of revivals. Not a planned out agenda thing. I'm talking about a real manifest move of the Holy Spirit. And for those of you who don't know, Journey to the Cross Church is the type of church that we come seeking His face and we come seeking a move of God. Amen. That's what we come here for. We don't come to play church. We don't. You want to play? You go. You go to recess, right? We don't. We don't play around. He said what? We quit school because they had recess. That's how much we don't play around. <laughs> Amen? And so this morning, what I'd like to do is this. And I'm not being ugly, so don't take it that way for those of you who are visiting for the first time. I promise, next week will be a nicer message. <laughs> I want to open up this altar. And I want to give everybody an opportunity to get serious with God. And I don't know if he's going to have us pray for you. I don't know if I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know this, that the Holy Spirit is here, and he's nudging and tugging at somebody's heart. And I will challenge you to do like Abraham. If you paid attention to the scripture that we opened up with, it said that God, God just chose Abraham because Abraham followed his decrees, his requirements, his commands, and his ordinances. You see, it does take an effort on your part. You want God to show up in your life? Do your part. Ask him to come. Submit to his will and do your part. You want your children to be saved? Do your part. Amen? I'll tell you right now, I get on my kids' nerves 
because I talk about God so much. And then they, they, and then they hold me accountable. Right? I watch a movie that has bad words, and they'll walk in and be like, Pastor George. <laughs> And I'll be like, don't wait, y'all say better words. I know you do. <laughs> Amen? This is a real church, baby. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> so let's do this. Would everyone please stand to your feet? Holy Spirit, come into this place. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And begin to move and stir every heart. Magnifying your life and paying more attention to that than paying attention to the promise that God made for you. I'm going to invite you to this altar to get serious with God this morning. I'm going to invite you to this altar <coughs> to lay it down at this altar and be done with it and not pick it back up. This past weekend, Rose and I went out on a little mini date. It was a last minute deal. We didn't tell anybody. We literally snuck out of the house. We didn't even tell our kids. They figured out we were gone after we left. Amen. You know what I'm talking about? They were like, we went looking for you. And we were like, too bad. Right? And we didn't tell you where we were going. Turned off our location. You know what I'm talking about? That kind of sneaking out kind of thing. And she was sharing with me that she had gone through a trial. Some of you remember, she was up here at this altar. And we were all praying for her. Her sister came up here. Her brother came up here. She said something that was so remarkable and it blessed my heart. She said this. She said, I wasn't playing when I went up to that altar and I let go of all my hurt and all my pain and all my bitterness and all my resentment and I left it there and I said, Lord, I will not pick this up. And I thought, wow, man, to hear that. To hear that. Because many of us will want to hang on to unforgiveness. We'll want to hang on you just wait till I see them. I'm going to tell them this, and I'm going to tell them that, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Lord, why won't you answer my prayers? <laughs> you with me? It takes an effort on your part. You got to release those people that have hurt you and wronged you. And you got to trust God. See, you know what, Lord? However you want to do it. However you want to do it. If you want to bless them, if you want to forgive them, Lord, you are my vindicator. Amen? Amen? I've heard people say, I forgave them because I know that the Bible says that if I forgive them, that God will punish them. So I forgave them so God will punish them. <laughs> well, then did you really forgive them? Or are you just waiting on God's wrath? <laughs> and if you're waiting on God's wrath, you need to change that. Amen. You hear me? There are people who have wronged me and they've hurt me. They went out of their way to hurt me. And I had to come to a place in a closet all by myself and say, Lord, save them. I forgive them right now. And if I could be honest with you, even if it was just lip service in that moment, I made a decision, a conscious decision to forgive them. And I said, I said it in that closet, Lord, if I ever see them, I will love them with your love. But I'm going to need your help because right now I don't love them. Maybe it's that kind of prayer you need to pray this morning. I'm telling you that God is faithful and he'll show up and he'll do it. And I've seen his saving grace save even enemies of mine to where we got to make it right. And we even got to minister together. That's the God that I serve. Only God can do that. Amen? Amen. Don't be a slave to those that have hurt you or wronged you. This altar is now open. Come and get serious with God. I invite you.
<laughs> Hear the heart's cry of a hungry people, Lord. Hear our hearts cry, O oh God. Hear our hearts cry today, Lord. The cry that we need to change, Lord, wherever we are. The cry that I want to be better. The cry that I am not worthy to come into the presence of who you are, Lord. But you said I will provide a sacrifice. That I will provide the means in which the people in whom I love can come to me and be with me and I dwell with them. Oh Lord God, you tell your people that you will let nothing stand in your way. You will let nothing stand in your way to dwell with us, Lord. with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he died for your sins and that on the third day the Father raised him from the dead, the Bible promises that you shall be saved. It says that they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I say this every Sunday, saying a prayer won't save you, but transferring your trust to Jesus Christ. Not giving God lip service, but giving him your whole heart. So this morning, I want to encourage you, as we get ready to come to a close, to surrender your heart, to dedicate your life to Christ. To confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Maybe some of you, you need to recommit your life to Christ. Well, that's the beauty of it. Is that God gave us the opportunity to recommit and to rededicate. Think about how many chances he's given you. If you're in this house and you're under the sound of my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and right now God is tugging at your heart, he's nudging at your heart, and he's calling you back to him a deeper relationship, a deeper revelation, a deeper understanding. Would everyone in here please say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, Father 
I come before you right now. I come before you right now. And I confess, and I confess that I'm a sinner. That I'm a sinner. And I need your forgiveness. And I need your forgiveness. And this morning, and this, this morning, morning, I confess with my heart. I confess with my heart. And I believe. And I believe. And I believe that you sent your son. That you sent your son to die for me. To die for me. And three days, three days later, and three days later, you resurrected him. You resurrected him. And he died for my sins. And he died for my sins. So at this moment, so at this moment, I confess with my mouth, I confess with my mouth, that I will live for him, that I will live for, him. for the rest of my life. For the rest of my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. for forgiving me, for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you for sending your son thank you for sending your to son die for me. To die for me. And more than that, and more than that, thank you for defeating death. Thank you for defeating from this day forth. From this day forth, I will live. I will live my life for you. My life for you. Till the day I take my last breath. Till the day I take thank my Thank you for your gift of salvation. Thank you for your gift and eternal life. And eternal life. I believe in you. I believe in you. And I trust in you. And I trust in you. And I call you my Lord. My Savior, my Savior and my Master. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Can we give Amen. God the glory? Hallelujah. We're going to pray to be dismissed. If you want to stay a while and linger and spend time with the Lord, that's okay too. We'll just hand you the keys and you can lock up when you leave. <laughs> Thank y'all for being here this morning. I'm, I'm really humbled by everybody that was here. I know that God is doing something amazing in this church and I want everybody to be a part of it. We're not going to leave anybody left behind. We are in this together. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now in the mighty name of Jesus and I thank you for this word. I thank you for always showing up and always being faithful. I pray in the name of Jesus that your people would flourish even in their families, that they would remember that their life is not, it's not directed or determined by their problem or their circumstance, that it is directed and determined by you. You are the author and finisher of our faith. And so this morning we lean on you, we trust in you, and according to your scripture, the Bible says that you will acknowledge us. I mean, that, you, that if we acknowledge you in all of our ways, that you will direct our paths and that you will lead us and guide us and nudge us and shape us and mold us into who you created us to be. So, Lord, we trust you. And I pray that church would begin when we walk out those doors. And that we would be representatives of heaven, ambassadors of the kingdom of God. That we would be dispensers of love, mercy, grace, forgiveness. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Now, if everyone would raise your hands for the priestly blessing. May the Lord bless you. And may he keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May he turn his countenance towards you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name. Journey to the Cross Church, I love you. Have an awesome, awesome week. For those of you who are visiting, if you're looking for a